Hey there, welcome to ATL and 29, a podcast where we look at the NBA from the starting point of Atlanta. My name is Kevin Chenard. I'm here with Glenn Willis and Tyler Jones, and we are recording on the evening of after the trade deadline. And I do not know where to begin. Maybe we should start with, uh, I'll flip it over to, to Tyler and DeJounte because he said he had to apologize for something about that he said last time. I don't even know which way this is going to go. So go you, the, the floor is yours. No, I feel like last time with DeJounte, I was a little too, I don't know, I, I think I was just a little too harsh. Um, I I didn't like, I don't, I didn't like how I was describing his play because I, 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 you know, when Glenn got to talking about DeJounte's defense, I was like, yeah, he he was he was committed to that end of the floor last time we seen him play. But I think I was I was just a little too focused on how he plays next to Trey offensively, where the aggression just goes away. And it, it just kept like I I just kept seeing him over and over again, just not be in that attacking mode the way he is. But then I'm like, I, you know, taking, you know, thinking about it more, he is being asked to be the primary defender on the team's best offensive player while he's on the floor with Trey Young. So that is different. So I can see where maybe the energy level level isn't there with DeJounte during those time frames. So it, it just goes back to, like, really the bigger issue between Trey and DeJounte overall is just, they need another defender. I mean, that's that's they they need another guy who's the primary. Like we saw it against the Celtics, uh, you know, you, you really also against the Clippers as well, where you know you're asking Dejounte to guard. Well, he didn't play against the Celtics, but against the against the Clippers, he's asked to guard James Harden the entire game, and he's like the only one capable of doing that on the team, and it's like. Okay, I can't ask DeJounte to be that and also be the guy who punishes teams for doubling Trey all the time. Like he's got to take a break somewhere. So I understand where the lack of aggression comes from. I just I was just too too really focused on like his sub his small his misuse on the offensive end. But it's it's really not his fault. Okay. Glenn, are you surprised that he is still on the team? Um I mean, it's going to be a terrible answer, but yeah, but yes and no. I mean, I, I think the Hawks were put themselves in a bad spot considering what they gave up to get him, that they had to kind of hold the price pretty high in terms of what they wanted to, to move him. Now, whether that makes sense, whether that's the right approach, we could debate that, right? There's the whole argument around sunk costs and all that sort of stuff, right? Um, but I'm not surprised that they're asking price based upon what was being reported, wasn't met here at the deadline. We talk all the time. It's hard to trade in the se- in, in, in the middle of the season. It's a lot harder, you know, you know. So I, I guess I'm I'm not surprised. Um I, I think the one aspect to it is you know, that I think we've it's it's kind of been a different story the last three, four weeks or whatever. There there was a time where we we recorded and we said Man, it just looks like DeJounte's just doing his own thing. But there's been times more recently where he's Trey was hurt. He stepped in and carried the offense a load in the fourth quarter, helped them win games. So so it hasn't been kind of one consistent kind of thing to watch with him, which is part of why I think a lot of us are so confused. Is like, what should we expect the rest of the year? Right? Is it going to be kind of up and down the way it has been the last three or four weeks? Or is it going to kind of settle into something that's maybe a little bit more constructive than it has been at times? Um, so I'm not surprised that he's still on the roster. I think I think um, I, I just think they had a very very high asking price, and I think that there's a direct line from that to what they gave up to get him. Also, Glenn, I just don't think there's a market for the art type that Dejounte is currently, where it's a Good point offensive point guard, but not a not an elite, you know, not not the upper tier top, you know, one of the five to ten, you know, real offensive difference makers in this league. He's not there, but he's good. He's a good offensive player. And he's re- really good at point guard, but um I, I just think other the you know, the point guards in general, like in the NBA. It's is it if it's not the deepest position, 
it's got to be up there. Like it. So I mean, we just saw someone of Spencer Dinwiddie with with a, who you know he has his flaws, but like he just got cut for nothing, and nobody's surprised. By that. Dennis Schroeder, Dennis Schroeder, uh, you know they just swap those guys. Those teams just swap guys, and you know Dennis is a low end starter in this league. Um, and you know they the the Nets got him for relatively nothing. Somebody can pick up Spence. Killing Hayes is a free agent now. Like he just got cut and waved. I'm Dejounte is clearly better than this guy. But uh, but my larger point is that he's not on the tier above. Like he's not so much better that teams aren't willing to take a worse player for less. I mean, I think we primarily we saw that with the Knicks, where they were like, "We'll just get Alex Burks back to give us that secondary creation, secondary ball handling, you know, in a lesser role where he doesn't, you know, we're not relying on Alex Burks to be the number two guy like you were with Dejounte, but." cheaper than acquiring DeJounte asking price two first round picks. I just don't think DeJounte's at the level where he's not on Drew, like he's not Drew Holiday, you know, tier. That's what, that's what uh, hopefully he can become that, but he's just not on that level just because primarily his defense hasn't, hasn't maintained with this increase of offensive uh, production. I, I, so to me, I'm like, consider what the Haw- like you guys said, with the Hawks paid plus, I just I, I don't think there was a big market for a point guard. Like, what contender needs a guard now? Especially with the Clippers getting James Harden, they were probably the last team that's trying to win that had a serious need at the point guard position outside of the Lakers. And the Lakers just don't have any. The Lakers were the team; they don't have anything to trade right now. So maybe they revisit that in the offseason. Yeah, I mean the Lakers deal. I mean, I, it's hard, we'll never know if the Lakers would have put Austin Reeves in the deal with the Hawks have taken that deal. And I think there was enough for, uh, around that to suggest that might have happened, but the Lakers held the line at that. So I guess we'll, we'll never know. But the other part with DeJounte is just that he's he's a different kind of point guard. He's not a high-level passer, right? His creation is mostly self-creation, kind of get himself into the mid-range, which is a little um, you know counter to a lot of the prevailing philosophy across the league, that you know, the kind of that mid-range shot. And um, and he's not you know, statistically, he's, you know, one of the lower end kind of finishers at the rim. And so when you think about kind of the postseason, you know, if he's your main guy or you're, if he's your like 1B, you know, or something like that, it's like, you know, it takes a certain type of light, light up construction to kind of make him work, right? You got to have a, a lot of passing because he doesn't have the highest end passing. Um, and then on defensively, it's, it's like, you know, you get to the second round of the playoffs, is he defending the other team's point guard well enough to, you know, like for 38 minutes? Like, I don't think, I don't think that's what he is, you know? So he's, a, he's also just kind of a, a, a kind of a different fit than a lot of the other point guards in the league. You know, I, I think he's good. He has a lot of value, but he's just different. And, and I think it takes a little bit more specific lineup construction to kind of to get the most out of him. And I think that makes it hard for teams to, like I said, in the middle of the season, teams aren't going to go like, you know, remake their whole rotation around the guy at DeJounte's level, right? A guy like Donovan Mitchell's available or, you know, someone that higher end's available. Yes, we will, like, recalibrate our rotation. DeJounte's not quite at that level. And just to bring this back a bit, um, there was some tweet about DeJounte's attitude, which I didn't like the framing, but I, like, to me, I felt like the, I felt like the undertone was missed where they were trying to paint DeJounte. It it came off, the tweet came off as if DeJounte's quote unquote a bad guy or a bad locker room guy, which I don't think is true at all. But what I do think is that I feel like the 29 other teams, because I mean, th- there's just speculation, rumors, reporting, so much is out with how DeJounte may or may, like DeJounte is perfectly okay with being traded, which is not, you know, that's not something you want to hear if you're a Hawks fan. And so, like, it, it, it's, I, I think the other 29 teams are confused. Like, DeJounte's in his best role offensively. He's having the best offensive season of his career. It's not close. Like, it, he's been so much better in Atlanta as an offensive player compared to what, what San Antonio Spurs. It's not close, close, but he doesn't like it. Like, reported, reported that he, he, he pref- and we see it on the floor, he prefers to be 
the guy running the offense at the top of the key, dictating the terms like, like he's one of the like, like a point guard. Because I mean, that's what he considers himself. But if you look at just the efficiency of his game, like compared in years past compared to this season, him being more willing to take catch and shoot threes, plus his, I, I feel like he's driving a lot more recently. And so he's getting into the free throw line a little bit more often than what he used to. Because he used to go to the stretch where he, he wouldn't get touched the free throws. At least now I feel like he's ticked a bit up of getting into the paint. Uh, so I, I'm 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 like, I can see other teams being like, if he doesn't like this role with Trey Young, why would he like this role on my team when he's not going to be the number one guy? And so so there, and that's 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 where it goes to how much of the Hawks going to get for this type of player who I think is in the top 50 in the NBA. But what what does that get you in today's league? Like Bradley Beal, I think, is a top 50 player too. Now, his contract went into it, but like the Wizards didn't get much from him. They didn't get anything. They got salary cap. So it's, it's just one of those where if you're not, if you don't play a premium position, which is the forward position, or have a unique skill, which which is why I think a combo has a lot of trade value, but the, but the Hawks, you know, the Hawks, and anytime his name comes up, the Hawks just aren't interested uh, right now, at least. But like, if you don't have like a unique talent or a unique skill, and you're not also like one of the top 20 to 25 players in this league, like your, your trademark is just going to be entirely dependent on the other teams. If they have a need for you or not. And like, to me, I looked at the rest of the league. I'm like, the only team that quote unquote needs him, and I don't even think they need him, which is why they didn't offer Austin Reeves, was the Lakers. I and I, I do think it's telling where where the Lakers, like under no circumstances, are we offering Austin Reeves for Dejounte Murray. I don't consider Austin Reeves to be on Dejounte Murray's level, but no. But at the same time, I could see the Lakers being like, we trade Reeves for for Murray. How does that make us better? And I think that's what teams are are thinking was like. How does trading for DeJounte Murray make us better? If I'm the Magic, if I trade for DeJounte Murray, how does having DeJounte Murray run our team for stretches make us you know, better enough to match the, the, the package that the Hawks – like the Hawks are not coming off these two first – like they have to get value for DeJounte Murray considering what they gave up, considering his contract, which is really good for the type of player that he is. But like it's just – his market is going to be different – Difficult to see where it's going to come out in the end, but I, I, I completely understand why the Hawks just like I, I just don't think his market really developed that way, and so like the Hawks were just like we'll just you know we're gonna clean wipe our hands and talk about this in the offseason. Yeah, I mean I think it's time for the talk. It's time for the Hawks to talk and listen and hear what Dejounte wants. And, you know, be real about him, about what the trade deadline was and what it wasn't. And, you know, see what his feeling is. Because if he's he's content to be here for at least the remainder of this season, then that that's one thing. If he's not, that's another thing. If he wants to be here long term, you know, that's an entirely different situation. But they, they've got to get a bead on what it is he wants. I do think that the Lakers still kind of make sense going forward. You know, we, we talked about them a lot, and I still think, like, if you look at what's going to happen this summer, I still think they make the most sense with the pieces that they have and what it is that they're looking for. They they need an innings eater yeah, that can just, you know, take shots and, you know, eat minutes and just, you know, That's what Shooter was on for stretches. Them. What's that? That's what Shooter was for them when he was there. He just took the yeah. regular season workload of dribbling the ball up and getting them to their office and creating offense. And they weren't going to ride that formula into the postseason. They were never going to do that. Right. But right. he, he, but he gave them enough in the regular season to kind of get them there. Now, DeJounte is a higher level player than Dennis at this point in time. So you get the appeal from the Lakers standpoint, but I agree with you, Kevin. I think the Lakers are right now the obvious fit, right. in in terms of kind of what, what makes, makes some sense there. Yep. Uh, just- beyond. DeJounte Murray, do you have any strong feelings about uh, other players that were traded, action that you wanted to see the Hawks get in on, other pieces of the roster that 
you wanted to see the Hawks trade for, not trade for? Jaden Springer. Like that's <laughs> a, I mean, that's the type of gamble that you would like to see the Hawks make, but they don't have the, I don't think they have the, you know, the assets to compete, you know, to, to get somebody like that. You know, he, he went for fairly cheap and I don't like, I, I don't think he's a real difference maker, but I mean, he has the tools to defend out in front. Um, so like, he, yeah, you would have liked to hear the Hawks come away with somebody like that. You know, some, somebody were a team who, who's shown a little bit, um, you know, I, I thought it was really interesting. Killing Hayes just got waived that like he, I, I like, I, I get his flaws, but like, Every time I walk, I, I've seen the Pistons play and I see him play. Like, I'm, a, I'm, I think he's going to be a long term player in this league, just being what he is, which is a good backup, you know, guard who can defend, make open three pointers and run your offense for short stretches. Like, I feel like he's going to have a big, you know, going to have a market, you know, if he clears waivers or not. He might not even clear waivers considering he's actually been productive in this league, but. I didn't. I didn't get that business. I, you know, so I, that that's somebody also. I, if I'm the Hawks, I'm looking at. Yeah, it would take some time with him. He's still a project. I know people on people on Twitter today. When I when I said congratulations to whatever functional team is smart and grabs him, and gives him some time to kind of actually develop, and people are like, oh, he's statistically the worst. But like, he's been in a terrible basketball situation his whole time in <laughs> the league. I mean, terrible. You know. And his defensive length, it's hard to find guys that move like him and have the size and length that he has. And it's worth trying to see what you can kind of kind of get from that. I I totally agree. I, I think the other trade that I heard from Hawks fans today about was why couldn't the Hawks pull the same trade that the Wizards did with Gafford with Clint, right? And And, and I think you have to have a conversation around – which of those two players is more is more valued across the league right now between Gafford and Clint? You know, Luca's young; he's he's in the early part of his prime. You know, and I think I think Gafford is a younger guy that can kind of kind of grow with him uh, in that sense. I have an appreciation for Clint, but uh, I mean Gafford's still pretty foul prone. But man, you talk about like if you ask me, like Glenn, the last two years, who are the five guys that? Like it really, really impressed you with what they've added to their game. Gafford is on that list. Like he's made himself into such a good player, you know. But I think a lot of Hawks fans are like, why couldn't the Hawks get that deal for Clint? Why couldn't the Hawks take that opportunity, that perceived opportunity, to make the, a change at that position that 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 you know Hawks fans have wanted to see for a long time? So that's the other one that kind of jumped out at me in terms of relationship to kind of the Hawks fans' frustration. I. Yeah, I mean, that one jumped out to me, too. I mean, Gafford has a better contract situation. Like, he's he's cheaper. Yep. He's under contract yep. for a longer period of time. Uh, I still, you know, if I'm the Hawks, I do try to sort of sell that deal. Like, I would, yeah. I guess in this, I, you know, sort of big picture with the Mavericks, it's like, you've got Luka, and obviously he's, going to be there a while he's going to be a centerpiece for a very long time but you know just all the pieces around Luca, like how long is Kyrie going to fit there and be happy with his situation like mm -hmm. if you're trying to win like this year next year I think Capella's a better deal and so if, I feel like there's a pitch to be made I, I do think that you know Gafford's probably the better value just if you take into consideration what they'll do for the rest of their contract, but you know, you, if you, if you can get their ear and, and sell them on the idea of Clint and, you know, making things happen now, uh, you know, I think he's a, it, it's a deal that you might be able to make, but maybe not. Yeah. And don't you also think I, that, I think... don't you also think that they tried really hard to make a deal that involved Clint in the, in the, in the off season and that that made it harder to even kind of start that conversation back up now. There was a lot of reporting around the Hawks and Mavericks trying to find a way to kind of make that deal work. And if that didn't go anywhere in the offseason, it seems like it would only be harder at this point in time to try to make that happen now. Yeah, perhaps. It, and, and you know, the emergence of 
their young center. I'm completely blanking on his name, but well, he's Derek been so Lively. impressive as a role man. What's yeah. his name? Derek Lively. Yeah, Derek Lively. He's man, is he big? Like when you see him in person, it's like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. It's like seeing Chris Stapps almost. Like it's just he's big. Like he, you know. That was the one thing that that Luca really had going for him in that 73 point game. It's like, oh my God, this Mavericks team without Kyrie is such a mess. But like Lively kept, lively kept the defense honest in that game, and and that really sort of changed the flow. Yeah, but, but he, he's think... a he's a rookie, and then the oh yeah, do you trust him in the postseason? Like nope. uh, they're they're trying to make a serious run. Like, that, that's hard. that's the idea, though. That's why he kind of makes more sense than Gafford. It's like yep. if you really want to make that push now, if you want, uh, you know, if you really want to be competitive this year and next, I don't think I think it's Clint over Gafford. And, and, you know, if you're feeling like I just need somebody to get me through a year or two until Lively is really ready, then I think Clint's a better fit. I actually, but. guys, I actually disagree with this. I think Gafford is actually the better option, not because he's a better player, but because you can just close with Derek Lively or you can start right. Derek Lively. You know, you don't have to worry about, like, I look, I know I'm not Capella's biggest fan, <laughs> you know oh but wow there, you need there an oxygen is, tank there, there is something there is something to having like like to me I look at the Maverick situation I'm like if you believe in Derek life why would I, why would I why would I put a veteran ahead of him who does the exact same things who does but doesn't have the passing chops that Derek life has Lively has real, like, like real ball skills in ways that Capella doesn't. And if I'm the Mavericks, I'm like, why would I you – no know, disrespect to Clint, who's been a great – play, like, he's been a great player in this league, but it's like, I'd rather get the younger, cheaper version who, if if I don't like what he's given me, because he's, he's just a flat-out upgrade over Sean Holmes, if I don't like what Gaffrey's giving me on a given night, I can go to Derek Lively or I can go to Old Hat. Uh, who, uh, why am I blanking on his name? Stanford, the, the other center that's going to play there for 80,000 years. Dwight Powell? Uh, yeah, Dwight, Dwight Powell. Powell. Like, I can go to Dwight. Like, I, I, can, I can have optionality. Or I can go with no center. I can go with no center. I can go with P.J. Washington. Like, I, I have options. If I, if I trade for Capella, you're locked into playing in 25 minutes a night. That's the like to me. I'm like I, I look at the Hawks right now, and I and I feel it when I'm watching a Kongu just play 33 minutes. These you know without Capella, I'm like it's it's different. It like the team just plays differently with the Kongu compared to Capella. But now that Capella's not currently you know playing, it's 48 minutes of we're playing the same way. DHO, heavy DHO, our centers are making choices. You know, our centers, we can trust our centers to make the correct play with the ball in their hands in ways we can't do that with Capella. And so I I understand why why the Mavericks were trying to win or like having Capella would be an upgrade over Gafford, but we have quality center play that already. We don't need to add to that. Like, if, if they if they trade for Capella, are they able to get P.J. Washington? I don't, you know, I don't think because – and then I, I just – and I, I just think, you know, macro view how the rest of the – rest of the NBA views Capella is not as if Capella hasn't been on the trade market. But I, I just don't think anybody's even – like, for whatever – I don't know how the Hawks view him, but I just don't think the rest of the league views Clint Capella the way the Atlanta Hawks organization use Capella and like to me I, I feel Capella's market is more closely to what the Rockets gave up to acquire Steven Adams than I, I think than people will realize yeah. Yeah. So, even though Adams is not going to play yeah. it, 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 it's interesting too because like the, Maver- the Mavericks are like they got to be ready for Denver right and Clint on the perimeter is just not what he was I mean he's had some really good success against Jokic, but that was like we're, we're going on like four years ago now, right? Yeah. Whatever that is, right? Against against the Clippers, they can play PJ at center, just like you said, Tyler. When when the when the Clippers play 
whether it's PJ Tucker at center or just outright play Kawhi no, at center. Or, you no, know, no, they, they'll PJ just play Tucker. Westbrook. He they'll hasn't play played him forever. Yeah, I just, nope. oh, okay. yeah, but he, 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 you think he's not going to find a way to get on the court in the postseason? Come on, you know. Yes, I do. I don't think he's going to, I don't think they value him. I think he's unhappy. I don't think they, like, he's been on the shelf for a long time. Like, coaches, I, I, think, I, think the like, I, I think he's done. And in, in, as far as the Clippers go, okay. I think the unless somebody gets hurt with with this Kawhi at center stuff, like yeah, but that's, that that's, that, but that's where PJ Washington is so valuable because he you can play him yep at center right again yep. in that lineup against against Phoenix is going to play you know kind of smallish kind of lineups too they they are they're t- they're t- they're tinkering with that as well yeah. and and the, now the the Mavericks have some lineup configurability I have no idea like how serious Oklahoma City will be in the playoffs this year, but they have the best record in the conference right now, you know, and you got to be ready for their five out stuff. So, you know, I feel yeah. like the Mavericks, people are, I, I saw some people say on, on Twitter, like, Oh, everybody's making the, like the, the Ma- Mavericks can swing lineups to the way that the opponent is going to play in a way that they could not 24 hours ago. Yep. That's and that right. to me, that is, that is, that's so important. Uh, I people were making like uh, people were saying some people were saying like the Knicks did really well. I don't. I mean, I don't really see that except that Tibbs kind of got you know his guy back. You know, Burks and he get his guy back. That is, he got a shooter. You know, you know, uh, one of the best shooters in the league. That and that's helpful and stuff. But I, I still have a hard time Kenny taking them as seriously. But like, I want to talk about like my view, and I tease this on Twitter today. Like teams that turn the page today, like. Just, I start with the Sixers. The Sixers basically like packed up <laughs> this season. You know, I don't think Embiid's going to play again. I think it's best for Embiid if he doesn't play again. And Maury was like, I'm cleaning the cap sheet for next year. Only Embiid and Maxi. I think only Embiid and Maxi are on the books after this season. So I'm like, they're going to change, uh, even though Siakam's making all the noise about want to be in India and in Indiana. I think they're going to chase Siaka. Like, and you know, I'm trying to figure out who are they going to chase. You know, you know, and that he's the first one that kind of comes to mind for me. Then maybe there's a, a, a someone that becomes kind of tr- you know a trade interest as well. But like, even like Charlotte turned the page. Like they just book night, they cut him loose. They cut several guys loose. Right, Detroit turned the page up there. I mean, who knows what what plan is in place in Detroit? But there were teams that were just like we're turning the page. And to me, that that you know, I felt like a lot of Hawks fans were like, I'm out. You know, on the rest of the season, and that, that's and that's mo- almost surely like for most people, like a temporary reaction, an immediate kind of reaction to being disappointed that nothing happened today. But to me, it's like turning the page is starting a condo the rest of the year. To me, turning the page is finding some way to get AJ on the court. Right? I don't care if he has to play five, seven, eight games at College Park before he can play in Atlanta. Right? It's how do we keep DeAndre Hunter on the court? Is it does he can, can he only play twenty two minutes a game on the second unit? Can but can they close with him defensively? Like he was so good against Tatum the other night, right? I mean, yeah, he was. you know, he was so good. And if it's only twenty five minutes a night, they need him. Those twenty five, like they literally have no one else that can do what he can do. And and now that we're past the deadline, it's like is this like those these minutes that Patty gets when someone's hurt or back to back? Like is Kobe going to start getting? And, you know, and so to me, I, I feel like if the Hawks. You know, they, they stood pat today because of big picture kind of thinking and planning, you know, if, if that's what was going on. It, let's make decisions the rest of the way this year based upon big getting building this team up to a 12 to 24 month timeline, not like can we sneak into the nine or ten seed, <laughs> you know, can we can we host a plan? You know, I, I just want to see them kind of operate with kind of bigger picture thinking i can understand to a degree protecting trade value to a sense up to the trade deadline starting clint right trying to get you know do whatever you can to kind of feature Dejounte, and he had a he's had a strong couple weeks you know here when he's been on the court right but i just you know that there are things they can do to figure out what they actually have with this group one through 12 or whatever number you want to pick that they haven't been doing this year at all Right. And so that's what I want to see. I want to see them. Can AJ work on what Quinn's trying to get his guys to do? Like, I don't, I, I don't know what's going on there. I mean, it seems like there's a lot more than just the basketball stuff going on this year. Right. 
Kobe seems like pretty ready, you know, if you watch him play in college, you know. So I just want to see them kind of let's figure out who we have that works with what we're trying to do. And the only way to do that is put more, you know, different variety of players getting these young guys, whether it's Lundy or Kobe and AJ or whatever. That that's what I want to see. Right. And and I I hope they win games. I, you know, for them, for their sake, they work hard and they're trying to figure it out and all that sort of stuff. And, 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 and I find most of the players on the team just like, you know, I, I find myself, you know, easy to root for, but I just want to see them operate, you know, big picture decision-making that that's, that's what I want to see. Turn the page, figure out what you have I, with this group and figure out what you don't have with this group and use that as a input into your decision-making in the summer. Glenn, I think the only thing I see that's going to change is I, I, I Ideally, like I would like for the Hawks to do that, but I, I just realistically, I think maybe a call who's starting that just happens if uh depending on how long Capella's out. I think that might be the only thing. I just don't because like the, the issue with Kobe is that you got Trey to John Team Boat. They're gonna play all your minutes at your guard spot. You gonna play? You can't play Kobe. Kobe's too slight to play the three, so he's probably out. AJ Griffin, he's got until he plays a minute of basketball. I'm just assuming he's not gonna play, and I don't think it has anything to do with his on court talent. Like I, I don't. I, I think AJ is like a separate. Like you know, this is me. It, it just feels like, considering he's not even like playing in the G League. This is just some he's going through stuff bigger than basketball for him. So I until like I see it on the floor, I, I can't make any call with AJ. So I just don't know with him. And Seth Lundy, I think Seth Lundy actually has a chance to maybe see some see some run, primarily because he's bigger. One, he can guard forwards. And two, I think something I felt watching the Celtics game. Um because the Hawks were just getting killed with Bruno on the floor, and it, it wasn't like Bruno was playing poorly. I just thought, man, it'd be nice if the Hawks would just go with Jalen at center. But they don't have the four. Like, they, they don't have – they only have three forwards on the team. <laughs> so it's it's just like you can't you can't play Jalen at center and, 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 what, go with Bogey at the three? Like, Bogey was struggling as the low man all night. So mm -hmm. I, I just think – I I to me – you know, it, it's frustrating, but I do think I do think a combo just playing 30 plus minutes a night every game for the rest of the season because they have they they have to see what they have. In them. Like it's. It would be one thing if Onyeka Okongwu was like mediocre or not good or not a valuable player. But when you hear. Well, when the like when the Pelicans are like. When the Pelicans are calling the Hawks about DeJounte Murray, they're asking for Onyeka Okongwu because they want to pair Onyeka with Zion Williamson. That just makes sense to me. And, but, like, the Hawks aren't going to do that because Onyeka makes perfect sense next to Jalen. So yeah. I'm like, well, instead of just playing this game, why don't you just play those two together all the time and build from there and see if you have something? Because, I, I, to me, I, I, you know, watching this stretch of games, I, I've been impressed with what, what Onyeka's done, and I'm not, but I'm not surprised by it. So I, I think I think that's the path with Onyeka. I'd like to see Kobe play because uh, they do need like they do need that. But I, I just don't. To me, I don't see Quinn Snyder making making that call where he's like, I'm gonna I'm gonna give Kobe take 15 minutes away from like Bogey and, and Dejounte. Like I just don't. I don't see Quinn who's trying to uh, like I, I I think Quinn's trying to win every game. To me, based on what he's done with this rotation, considering you know. Like Kobe just hasn't had a chance to, like at all this season, even with the injury. So I, I just think they have a certain plan with Kobe, and they're not going to stray from that. I I think I agree with a lot of what what you've said. I don't think it really costs them anything to do it. Like they could go mad scientists and probably still make the play in. Uh, you know, they're I think like their only real competition is Brooklyn. Brooklyn lost, so I think the Hawks have two games on them now. And you know, they it's you know, to to me the two biggest priorities are 
I don't know how you want I, the first one. I don't really know how to phrase it, but it's it's like a combination of two things. It's play a Kongwu next to Jalen, yep, and play them a lot of minutes. Like I, I I just want those two attached at the hip for the rest of the season. And Jalen has to start, so Onyeka has to start. Like it, it getting Onyeka twenty four minutes off the bench isn't enough. Like he's. He's got to play more minutes, and he has to start because that's just a natural pairing that's the future of the team, and they just need as many reps together as possible. And, and, and he needs they, to play against other team starting center. He, he needs right. reps against the first-string center. But, like, they – I mean, it's been true all season long to me. Like, I like I thought Jalen Onyeka should be together. Bay and Capella should be together because, like, you just get a different – defensive versatility with Jalen and Onyeka that you don't have with Clint and Sadiq. You just want to play one way with those two and you can mix it up based on the opponent when you're playing Jalen and Onyeka. So like, it's just so obvious and natural. I think that, that those two have to play together. They have to start and Onyeka is going to have to play a little bit more minutes accordingly. And then as far as like getting deeper with the young guys, to me, it's, it's just Kobe. Yeah. I, I, and I, to me, like when you say, okay, DeJounte, Trey, and Bogey are your guards, that's your guard minutes. Okay, but I feel like over the last month, the best thing that the Hawks have done is play some Trey, Bogey, DeJounte together. And, and those lineups have looked pretty good. And so you've got Bogey guarding somebody bigger. But like to me, Kobe plays bigger than DeJounte does. Like if he's the low man, weak side helping at the rim, like. <laughs> he can actually get in the way a whole lot more than DeJounte yeah. does. So, like, I don't feel like if I play Trey, Kobe, Bogey, that I've lost a whole lot defensively. Like, I, I think that, you know, Agreed. it's going to be a, maybe a mess at first because Kobe's just a rookie. But, like, after he's gotten through his first, you know, three quarters of a month worth of reps, I, I think, you know, he's he's going to fit in enough defensively that you can roll it out there on the court and not feel bad about it. So, so those are the two to me. And then everybody else, like I, Lundy's fine. I just feel like if you weren't going to play Lundy when you were ravaged by injuries and had no forwards early in the season, that just doesn't make sense to do it now. You know, at 23 years and nine months is not different than 23 years and six months. Like, you know, you're hopeful for AJ, but it really just doesn't make any sense until he goes plays basketball in the G League for three weeks at least. Like, you know, he just doesn't look ready. And... I don't think there's any point. I think, you know, you're risking making it worse by throwing him, throwing him on an NBA floor until you just give him a chance to kind of go play it out on a small scale uh, with a less bright lights and just get it worked out down there for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to pretend like I have like the, the the whole rotation kind of figured out. What I'm saying is, I want the principle that they're operating from the rest of the year to be like, let's figure out what we have. So, you know, sorry, Wes Matthews, but when there are minutes available due to back-to-back -back injury, whatever, they're not going to you. Maybe those are going to AJ, you know, so, you know AJ gets his up or Lundy or whatever. Right. And then, you know, Bo beyond back-to-backs or, you know, whatever you're, you know, you, you know, when the minutes that were going to Patty, you know, when they needed, you know, the next guard to kind of the rotation, those are going, even if it just starts with that, Right. Yeah. No more Patty minutes. They're Kobe's. No more Matthews minutes. They're AJ's or whoever or their Lunnies or whatever. I just want the principle to be to figure out what we have. Right. To figure out what they have, and that they, they might have to be opportunistic. They might have to kind of manage the situation. It might be just depend upon health, injury, back to back schedule, whatever you know. But I just I that's that's just what I want to see them them do. Right. Is to explore what they do have what they don't have and to let that be the top objective for the rest of the year that maybe it can be on the same level as let's get in the play in or, you know, and see what kind of noise we can make in the playoffs. They gave Boston a, you know, a decent push last year and probably think, you know, why can't we do that again? Right. The top of the East is I think not as strong this year as it was last year, you know? Right. So depending upon kind of where, what seating you kind of land in and all that sort of stuff, maybe, maybe you, you, you can. So I'm not, I'm not saying don't try to win, I'm not saying waste, you know, trace six year of the season. I'm just saying make that a priority that you're operating um to. And and that's just that's that's what I 
that's what I'd like to see the rest of the year be about. So, you know, not no easy answers in terms of like, oh, this is where Kobe, I, I don't, there aren't easy answers for how you create minutes for Kobe, AJ, whoever else, right? But if that's a priority that you're managing to, opportunities will present themselves along the way. They they always do in some way. I, I think I think the only thing with Kobe playing potentially at the three in certain situations, Kevin, like you were saying, or you know, playing alongside a DeJounte and Bogey or DeJounte and Trey, is that you can see a younger guy losing confidence if they're just constantly getting ran through. In way like if they're just getting if if, if the opposing offensive player is just able to physically muscle them, you know, on both sides of the floor and get them out of their comfort zone. And then now it's like you got Kobe playing a different way in order to compensate. Whereas when Garrison Matthews is out there, Garrison Matthews is just throwing his body around. And like it doesn't matter. Like he he's I, I respect the heck out of Garrison Matthews' willingness to take on the challenge he's not physically capable of taking on. Like and he does it all the time. So I, I can I can see the organization just macro being like, there's no re reason to mess with the kid. Like, let's let Kobe have build this continue to build his confidence up in the G League. And if there's opportunities available, like I I, I agree with you. If Patty like I'd rather Kobe be playing over Patty, but I'm not like I'm not that like. It's it's weird. I'm usually I want to see the young guys play, and it's not that I'm not impressed by what Kobe's doing. It's just his archetype isn't right now. If Dejounte's still on the team, like to me, I'm like, you know what? What's the point? I'd rather I'd rather Kobe be in the G League, getting all the usage, getting all the minutes, doing what's exploring what he can do as an offensive player, while building strong defensive habits on in a good defensive environment with the college. Park Scott, so he can be ready to go next season when they're going to need him to possibly play twenty five plus minutes every night, depending on what they do in all, you know, in the off season. But um, so I'm not really like really amped up for that. Not not I, I would like to see it, but I, I think it's okay. Like to me, it's just I just want to see a column start play thirty plus minutes. I'm I, I just. I, I've seen the ceiling with Capella. Like, I just it, – and it's not like he's a bad player. Like, I understand it. But, like, to me, I, I feel like the – like, the the inability to just have Capella maybe this night you're only playing 15 minutes based on the opposition where he has to play 24 minutes a night, I, I feel like that's hurt the Hawks. You know, it, particularly yeah. this season with Jalen Johnson. Like I, I just really I, I just feel that considering Jalen might possibly be one of the best defensive rebounders in the game today, like there there might not be five better rebounds regardless of position, considering just the the space and the, everything Jalen's able to do as a rebound, like that, and, and like with the Congress ability to play higher up the floor, like I, you know, the Celtics even though the Celtics were getting everything in the paint. We, I thought the Hawks were playing good defense against the Celtics. I just think I, I think they were somewhat connected and they were executing. They just didn't have the personnel to really deter the Celtics from what they wanted to do offensively. It, it, I, I was, I've been impressed the last couple of games with, with the Hawks' defensive execution. And I, I, I watched it. I'm like, this is the future to me. If you've got somebody as the lead of a rebounder as Jalen on the defensive end, you know, then what's Capella's value as a defensive player? Especially if, like, while drop is great, I, I think drop is what Capella does best, and I think that's also what Sadiq does best. But I, I'm not sure that's true for the other guys, considering their screen navigation, right. considering everything else. Like, to me, Jalen's Jalen's better playing with a center like a combo defensive. Like he, he just is, and yeah. so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm where I'm at the point where, you, you, I don't think like to me every you know. I just I just feel like they need to the organization needs to make a pivot, just play the Congo thirty plus minutes, and if some nice Capella only plays fifteen minutes, he's only playing fifteen minutes. Yeah, and and, and well, I mean, there, and there's a few things like. I, uh, you always teams generally want to manage optics around stuff like this. Clint's hurt. Like just 
throw out a fake minutes restriction for Clint the rest of the year. Right? The there, the there's year, a yeah. way to provide provide cover for kind of what you're doing there that that allows you know Clint to kind of maintain some pride and stuff like that, right? And Clint, Clint is a helpful player, but Clint yeah. is a more extreme example, you know, around Dejounte. It's fit, right? That's the issue. It's it's fit, right? And it's the feature that the Hawks need to kind of carve out, building around Trey and Yucca and Jalen and and other guys that are, you know, Bogey's a huge part of what they do right now. Like, I mean, you can't be dismissive of that at all. Um, but in terms of kind of really figuring out, like, what are we what are we running? What, what are we going to run? And what does our roster need to look like to run the schemes that we're going to run? It's leaning into that stuff. Totally agree. Um, but maybe last question, and I, I, I'm going to start with you, Kevin, if that's okay. Like how about all these players on waivers? The Hawks aren't going to touch. The Hawks are not going to touch any of those guys, right? I don't think so. <laughs> okay. I, I just wanted to add one thing about the development okay. and sort of having the the vision going forward. To me, developing the young guys this season is getting Onyeka Jalen minutes together. But also getting them whatever they can get out of the postseason, whether it's a playing game, seven game series, yep. like that's invaluable to get them those minutes. Like they've played, you know, and Yek has played a lot of NBA minutes at this point. But if he's the starting center in a playing game, if he's the starting center and, you know, if they can squeak their way through to be in like in an eight seat or something like that, that would be huge for him to get to play those minutes alongside Jalen and just kind of test it out so they know what they have in it. It, it doesn't go against, you know, what Trey wants to do for the rest of the season, what DeJounte wants to do for the rest of the season. I think it's just, it's, it's, uh, you know, uh, synchron synchronized with, with the other goals. So I don't, I don't think it's really one or the other. I, I think they need to prioritize their semi developed young players over the deep young players and then just let them so, sort of figure that out on the back end. Yeah, that's for sure, for sure, be the high priority. And then, and the Sadiq, like we talk about drop too, but I'm convinced that you can make Sadiq a good switch defender. He just mm -hmm. needs better no, angles. He, he needs yeah. better technique, right? Yeah. Now, now, like last, we remember against Boston last year, they're trying to switch it. I mean, it was atrocious, right? It was just really, really bad. But I, when I think about Sadiq as a switch, like we all saw like the clip from where J.J. Redick was talking about how Trey is an improved defender. He talked about his show angles, right? He talked about just being more proactive, having more impact when he's showing, et cetera. And I feel like that's the direction to take Sadiq. If, if you want to play Hunter, Sadiq, or, or Hunter or Sadiq, I guess in this case, since we're talking about Sadiq, Sadiq Jalen, and Yeka, and Switch, he just needs, he's physical enough. Like, you need to be physical at the yep. point of the Switch, right? It's his, it's the angles and it's being proactive in 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 the technique and kind of starting to master that more. But again, he was in a terrible basketball situation in Detroit, you know, where they were doing all sorts of crazy stuff, you know. And so I feel like I feel they like are. it doesn't I feel like it doesn't have to be drop with Sadiq. I think no, that is where fair. he's most comfortable and confident. But I feel like he's the guy you could develop into being a part of a, a, a lot that's of the right. switches, right? That's, that, right? that's what I think. Yep. I've, I've yep. actually been, I've actually liked what Sadiq's and done. And better, yeah. He's been better the last couple of weeks. Recently. He he had some he had some miscues in the Celtics game where yep. I think he, him and Okongu weren't on the same page on a couple of a uh, couple of fake picks or whatever. But like overall, like I've been I feel like he's throwing he's throwing his weight around a little bit more, bothering guys a little bit better. Yep. Uh, uh and I I I've been impressed with him. I know he he's now making jump shots again, but like I, I continue to be impressed by his drives, like the, just in his ability to get to the front of the rim and draw fouls, like that's and he just plays hard all the time, right? All and the time. that's not enough. That's not always enough to go overcome some deficiencies and stuff like that. But on defense, sometimes effort can go a long way, right? And yeah. and so he, I so he, I I'm finding myself, you know, I'm finding it easier and easier and easier to root for him just because he's. I'm not making shots. I'm still going to bust my ass. You know, I'm yeah. going to help rebound. I'm going to, you know, you know, do what I can. And and I just think that's a that's an endearing thing to to, to watch a player do to me. You know, yeah, he's young enough okay. to again playoff minutes for him if they can get to a playoff series. Like that's huge. Like they, you know, these guys just yeah. need more reps, more experience at the higher stakes. 
and I, and I think that's just the overall like the big the big thing with the Hawks is like they're their supplementary players are still young. Like outside of Trey, all these guys are under the age of twenty five. And you compare that to the teams that are trying to win back that are consistently winning, they're just older teams. Like th- those teams are just filled with guys Capella's, you know, my age, Capella and uh Bogey's age. Like they that's just the reality. Like if you want to win, you win with older players. The Hawks are still in we're trying to figure out who like they they've constantly been in this mode of trying to figure out what they want to do, how they want to build this team around Trey. So combined with their, you know, their unwillingness to pay the tax. So, you know, it, you're always resetting, getting, you know, younger rookies and, and trying to implement them. So hopefully, like to me, I, what I'm hoping because based on the team, I'm I'm hoping base is going to be on the team long-term just because you, you got to, you got to, you can't just keep, churning these guys out like if hunters traded regardless of how i feel about deandre now you got to find somebody to replace hunters minutes if you're not getting value in return you know well, a, a big size four yeah, in addition if, to that bay, bay is stepping into the space that jc had as a leader right? exactly yeah. and and that matt and kevin you're closer that's what i feel like i'm seeing like but are, are you picking up on that like i mean i mean quinn pumps sadiq up all the time like post game and all that sort of stuff maybe it's a lead by example it's just yeah it might be more of a lead by example thing yeah that 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 sounds i mean i mean you could see it like he plays the way you want everybody to play that's 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 okay that's That's, yeah that's good you got a guy who okay my shots aren't falling i'm making these mistakes but i'm still gonna play hard like that's good. Co- like, look, I, I looked at the Hornets. Oh, it, it, <laughs> it's it, bad. bad. It's bad. Brandon, like, watching like somebody like Brandon Miller, a rookie, yelling at his teammates to get the bleep back. It, I'm like, they got, they got the, you know, the Hawks aren't there. Like when people are like, the Hawks got bad vibes. The vibes are that they're not winning and they feel like they should be winning. But guess what? The NBA is hard. It like really it's hard. hard to win yep. games, and especially hard now where every team is trying to win. And so, like the 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 plan in the offseason can't be okay. I'm going to trade Hunter to get under the tax, but then we're going to keep you know we're going to keep the same core. Like you made the decision with DeAndre Hunter, stick with it. And I I I, I feel some some t- like the only reason why I'm not saying about Dejounte it's not that. DeJounte isn't good and the Hawks haven't made a decision with him. It's just that you have both. And, and they play the same position. So you can afford to potentially upgrade your roster or find somebody who can fit better uh next to you know, next to on, on this Hawks team compared to DeJounte. Not that DeJounte doesn't can't fit with this team, but if you're not willing to pay the tax, that limits your options. So you have to be more creative and you have to be smarter with how you how, how you're going to go about this offseason but like to me trading hunter is like okay you trade him now you need a six eight big power forward who's solid defensively and can make open three pointers yeah and, and he and he's both, been both he's been good when he's been on the court this year he has been good and he's shown a lot of different stuff shot a lot of you know i know you know kevin you put a put a tweet out you know kind of one of his plays of the night and he talked about what he's been talking about quicker you know technique and all that sort of and he's just he, he's showing a lot yeah you know, i i knock on what i hope they can figure out how to kind of keep him healthy you know and if that's he can't play more than 26 minutes or whatever right like i just you need him right and and it, it, if they're going to continue to not pay the tax not use the exceptions and stuff like that do you have to value every draft pick you have and i feel like they did that in the last draft i felt like that was the first draft where they moved to get gay right i thought lundy was a great pick i thought kobe like really really fits what they need and i just thought they took it a lot more seriously like for the first time in a while and they if, if they're going to try to navigate a roster like this around trey without doing that you know until they're like a legitimate like top four in the east Ho- hopefully when if they get to that level they'll push in and, and go into the tax but i know hawks fans are like i will believe it when i see it you know and i understand the sentiment right but if you're going to do that, you 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 better do your work 
on draft night and fill your depth up with young guys that you can develop into being the not only good players, but players who can do the things you need them to do. And so I, you know, people are frustrated. Hawks fans are frustrated. I feel like the Quinn hire, good. The draft night, good. JC trade, bad. But I felt like Quinn was like, I can't play JC. Like you watched the, the Boston series, JC and Hunter can't play. Like offensively, it just it's not going to work, right? Uh, that's not me giving them a pass. I, I hated that trade. Like, but what was bad was the way they got to the point of having to basically give him away, right? That's what was bad, right? To me, and, to me. and so, so that that's that's the thing for me is you, you want to you want to stay stay below, you know, stay out of the tax. You better you better you better kick ass on draft night consistently to do that. I, and to get back to the JC point, I, I think to me. Because they clearly just traded him to get out of the tax. And that was the primary, secondary, and tertiary motivation. And, and to free up minutes for Jalen. But the Jalen point is important. Because, like, to me, I'm like, they didn't know, combined with that, they also didn't know what they had in Jalen. They clearly did. Until, until it became apparent that he was one of their better players during the season. But they've known for the last couple of years, couple of seasons, and we talk about this, that Jalen and Capella, because of Jalen sh- has the same shooting concerns that John Collins had, like that's not an ideal fit. And that's shown itself, like to me, I feel like that that with Jalen starting, it's been better for the team. But you just see, you just see it where to me, I'm like, if you're going to trade John Collins, I thought Capella should have also been traded as well. In the offseason, turn the book over. Oh, they they tried. I'm like, but but they they're not with like I think the only thing that was on the table table was the Mavericks trade, and and we're looking back at it now. They might have could have had Derek Lively, and and you know it's just I I don't know I I like to me I'm just like it's just one of those things where you have to commit to you got to commit to it to a to a plan like having a convo spend the entirety of his rookie scale contract when he's at his cheapest being a backup center splitting time half and half with Clint Capella like how how's that help how's that help the convo how's that help the I, I don't know how that's helped the long term impact of this Hawks team and like the fear of taking a quote unquote step back I, I feel like the Hawks took it anyway like they they just did you know, just based on you, you, you have all your resources tied up in the center position when other teams give themselves options at the center position. If you don't want to play a center, sometimes it's best that you don't have a center on the floor. You know, it, some other teams have have found that out years ago, but the Hawks are like, well, we got it. We we have to play twenty four minutes with Capella. And we have to play 24 minutes with a Congo, and we can't deviate from that plan at all. And I think that's that's hurt them these last two seasons in particular. So, like to me, I'm like, if you're gonna trade John Collins because of the fit, you know, in Quinn's system, I watch like I, we all watched some, how the summer league played, summer league team played. I thought there's no way Capella can fit this team. There's, he can't do this stuff. But they 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 stuck with him. I, and I get it, you know, he's a veteran and he's well respected on this Hawks team. But I, I just think it, like, I to me, I feel like the Capella, the lack of decision on the Capella Congo is emblematic of the issues with, with this Hawks team overall. Where it's like they just don't want to, they don't, they're they're scared to make a choice, and that that's hurt them. So it's almost hard to yeah, differentiate I mean, I mean, having too many centers versus having not enough forwards. Go ahead, Glenn. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, uh, you know, when when Capella is eventually moved off this roster, I still think the prevailing memory I will have is it was so smart to go get him when they got him because Trey needed that at that time, yeah. right? The screen, I, I know I bore people, the screen angles, the pitchbacks, the, you know, the, you know, get, getting Trey the ball where he needs it. I mean, that has... When Trey, I I firmly believe Trey will go into the Hall of Fame 
and he will mention Clint Capella in that speech, right? <laughs> and, and, and so while fans are frustrated with kind of where the Hawks are, and I've said, I want to see Inyaka start and get the starter minutes, I will, I will, I, I will hope that there's never like a diminishing appreciation for how he helped Trey. But that being said, there also comes a time when, you know, a different plan is appropriate and going to serve you better, right? It can be true that he really helped Trey and be true that it's time to, to kind of shift um, roles, priorities, minutes distribution, et cetera. Like all of that can be true at the same time. So I, 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 I think Clint's a great teammate. I think he plays hard and I think he helped Trey tremendously this time. I think that's fair. Like when you, when you talk about, you know, can, can Capella deal with a bench role? And it's like, I don't know, but like, if there's a person in the NBA that you like is seven feet tall and you trust to be a good dude, I think it's Clint. Great. Totally agree. <laughs> and to help. So Yaka. maybe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think Clint's just, I, I've never seen anybody say a bad word about Clint Capella. Like everybody loves him. So I think he's, you know, I think he is a good fit, but you know, to me, and and you, 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 we opened the can of worms about you know not going over the luxury tax, which is a good can of worms to open because it's just the shadow over everything. But you know, when you talk about having a plan for the rest of the season, that's why I think Kobe is important because. He needs to be the economical rotation player that kind of makes the under the tax thing work. Like if if you're not going to have Dejounte pass this summer, I think you know you want Trey to believe in Kobe as a guy that 18 months from now, yeah, that's a rotation guy that I can trust having in the rotation with me, because there aren't going to be a lot of thrifty options that are ready to play. Um, you know, Kobe's getting experience now so that he can get ramped to that level. And, I, you know, I believe that he's fully capable of it, but I think they they need to do enough with Kobe in the remaining games so that uh, he can show the organization and specifically Trey that this guy is a rotation guy. Uh, you know, he's going to be ready soon enough to step in because you're not going to be able to keep everybody that's that's being paid right now and he's going to have to replace somebody. Well said. Yeah. And just like one last thing about the lux luxury tax, it's just it just takes options away. Like not being willing to ever go into the tax. It just takes your leverage and your options away of of ways to improve your roster. Cause they they've had opportunities to acquire the point of attack defender, but they just haven't been willing to spend the cap, like to spend the real cash that doesn't affect anything else other than one man's wallet they just have been willing to do it and so that's where the hawks are are constantly having to make these choices of losing talent for nothing so yep all right we've, we've kept glenn up past his bedtime way past and i'm on the left <laughs> to let him go <laughs> i appreciate I, you gentlemen i'm just joining proud i tonight. stayed awake the whole the whole time <laughs> wow. I know you're going to stay awake for Tyler, but I didn't know if you're going to stay awake for me or not. But oh, no. I'm glad you did. Yeah, I, I mean, let's 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 uh, see how the rest of the season goes, and let's see what priorities they they demonstrate that they're you know operating from, and let's see if it looks different. I'm anxious to see like how it looks. Um, so we got two games coming up here the next couple nights, and um, you know, we'll see who all is available and stuff. But I hope the games are still fun. I think there's a lot of interesting reasons to continue watching this team i understand the frustration fans had today well i, I know i understand the frustration of fans that feel like they're stuck from a roster construction perspective but i think there's a lot of compelling reasons to watch this team and uh, i'm looking forward to that even still all right good night bob good night bob good night bob